So I'm very excited to be giving a seed saving talk. I have given talks before, but it's been several years and this will be a pretty different talk than I've done before because it'll include stuff about trialing and breeding and sort of more big picture and movement stuff. And also I've got five hours, which is great. Um, so I'm from central Virginia. I've been growing seeds at Twin Oaks Seeds Seed Farm for something like eight years now. Um, and I'm also, um, in the last two years, have been part of starting a new seed growers cooperative and seed company to retail our seeds and also seeds from other, um, from the other farmers in the cooperative. Um, so, we'll get started. Um, yeah, like I said, we're gonna, I'm gonna get into some, some of the big, big picture stuff, like why does this matter? Why is this important? Why is this exciting? Um, so, empowerment is a big, um, is a big aspect of this. If, you, um, if you're always getting your seeds from a company and you don't know how to save your own seeds, you're dependent on that company. Um, and this happens, I've heard this happen a lot of times where there'll be some really, so there'll be some hybrid variety that a farmer depends on to fill a certain niche in their farm. And then all of a sudden that, the company that offers that hybrid will decide that it's not um, profitable for them and they'll discontinue it. And then the farmer doesn't have that variety and they have to scramble to find something new. So if we are dealing with our own seeds, saving our own seeds, we don't run into those kind of situations or potentially much worse situations um, where you just have you know, corporations that control all the seeds and you just always have to go back to them. Um, and um, so basically, there's this concept of food sovereignty that a community that controls its food supply has a lot more political t control over everything that they're doing. And the seed supply is part of this picture. Um, and this is, you know, the food sovereignty movement, the seed, seed saving movement is um, something that people are thinking about all over the world and um, especially just in the face of GMOs and, um, and proprietary schemes with seeds. Um, this is sort of like the counter movement of, of the people to, to maintain and reclaim our control of of our food supply. Um, so, let's see. When we save seeds locally, ourselves, um, locally, regionally, and on farm, we're able to get better seeds um, that are adapted to our conditions. And I'll, I'll get into that a lot more. Um, and uh, I, I guess the, the uh, I'll just give a quick example of this. Um, downy mildew is a disease on cucurbit crops that I focus on a lot. Um, they don't get it west of the Mississippi, like at all. They don't know what it is. So if you've got your seed production and your seed breeding all going on in Colorado and in the Northwest and in California, it's all being done by people that have no idea what downy mildew is. They don't, they're not selecting for it. They're not looking for it. They're not, um, so ultimately, you've got a seed system that isn't going to be getting you resistant material. It's not going to be maintaining resistance in the material that we have. Um, so when we bring seed production and the seed movement and thinking about seeds and selection and breeding and all these things that are um, part of a healthy seed movement, when we bring that back to the region, we can start to complete those feedback loops. So this is some of the elements for what a regional system, seed system looks like. Um, I put variety trials first. And um, basically, you need to know what you're working with. And variety trials is the best way to do this. Now, there's different kinds of variety trials. There's um, you know, a replicated, more scientific trial. But there's also just planting a bunch of stuff and looking at it, seeing what works best for you. Farmers are doing this all the time, informally, seeing what varieties are best, and next year going with the best ones. Um, so that's a really important um, element of a, 
healthy seed system. You want to share, share the information about, you know, that you're getting um, from the trials and, um, you know, with neighboring farmers, but ideally with a broader network. Um, and then uh, education, basically what we're doing here to get people to be thinking more about seeds, knowing how to save their own seeds. We've lost a lot of knowledge that, um, that used to be a lot more inherent to what farmers and gardeners did. So we have to sort of consciously bring that knowledge back. Um, local and regional selection. Um, basically, when you're, growing, when you're producing seeds in the region, you're doing regional selection. So you're going to be improving the varieties over time. Now that takes some thought. Um, um, and I'll get into that later. Um, and then, and let's see. Um, again, like once you're doing the selection and breeding, how do you get those seeds out to people? How do you share seeds? You know, so this is, this is regional seed companies, this is seed exchanges, um, this is seed swaps, this is meeting and talking about seeds, this is sharing seeds with your neighbors. Um, seed source transparency I put on here because it's something that um, I think a lot of people don't know, which is that a lot of seeds, even organic seeds, come from a global market. Um, so, and, and a lot of people that buy seeds don't know that, that some or many of their seeds are coming from a global market. So I, I really want to introduce and promote this concept of seed source transparency so that people are thinking about, well, I might have bought the seed from, um, you know, this company that, that is headquartered nearby me, but where are they getting the seed from? And, and I want to, you know, ideally I want that to be a value that people are really looking for and that, that seed companies are thinking about and talking about. Um, and then organic agriculture is, it kind of goes along with this concept of regional selection. When you're selecting for regional conditions, um, you're going to get seeds that work better in the region. And this is similar for organic agriculture. If you're selecting for seeds that do better with organic systems, you're going to have seeds that work better in organic systems. So, we, you know, there's organic, there's regional, there's both, and that's kind of what we're going for. Um, so we're going to cover seed saving and I have a lot of um, demonstrations that we're going to do and look at some seeds and um, maybe walk around the garden some. Um, I'll talk some about selection because when you're, when you're saving seeds, you're always doing selection. Um, even if you, there's n not making a selection is, is a selection. Um, talk a little bit about breeding work and um, more about the big picture and variety trials. Um, okay, so getting into seed saving. By the way, if, if you all have questions, just like let me know. Um, if you need a clarification or you want to stop me, just let me know. Um, also, I'm going to have a lot more pictures in this presentation in just a moment. <laughs> uh, so these are some, some basic things to know, some vocabulary about, um, let's see. Actually, we're, we're going to cover all this later. This just sort of tells you what we're going to cover. I'm going to move past this. Okay. Um, or did people want to look at that more? Is that, is that good? Okay. So um, this is some bas basic vocabulary about different kinds of seed stocks. Um, so open pollinated is seeds that you can save seed from the population and plant them. And they'll, when you plant them, they'll look pretty much like what you had the year before. Um, and that's what I work with, except for when I'm doing breeding project because I, I also do make crosses. Um, hybrids are when you have two stable populations and you cross them. 
Um, and in the first generation after the cross, you get what's called an F1 hybrid. Um, and the F1 hybrid is very, um, all the plants look similar. Um, it's, it's actually a good way to, one of the things people like about it is that it, is, it can be more conducive to a very uniform crop than, than open pollinated techniques can be. But um, when you save seed from that, you get your F2 generation, and that'll be all over the map. It'll be characteristics from, you know, you've got some plants that look like each parent, and then everything in between, and then some stuff that's just weird. Um, so hybrids are not, um, they're not a bad thing. It's what you do anytime um, you make a cross between two varieties to breed it, you're, you're making a hybrid. Um, and then it's just a question of what you're doing what you're doing from there. So in my breeding work, I'll, I'll make that cross, I'll see how it is, and then I'll, then I'll go to the F2 generation, and I'll look for good, um, good plants in the F2 generation, and, and keep selecting from there. Um, let's see what else. The big thing about hybrids politically is that it's harder for farmers and gardeners to produce and save hybrid seed. Um, so, by using open pollinated varieties, uh, we maintain more involvement and empowerment in our seed systems. Um, another thing about open pollinated is that when you're saving seed from an open pollinated population, you can adapt it over time to your conditions. Um, or adapt it or keep it adapted. Whereas if you're just buying and using hybrid seeds, it'll work a certain way and that's it. You can't move it, you can't change it, you can't work with it. Um, so open pollinated have a, a real strength in that way compared to hybrids. Well, um, hybrids have, have their own strength for some plant types. There's a hybrid vigor phenomenon for some kinds of plants that I'll get into. Um, but if we're doing really uh, thoughtful breeding work, I think that we can uh, have OPs that are, that are comparable um, for those plant types. And that would be corn and broccoli and cabbage are really the few things that really respond to hybridization. But most plants, um, the hybrid isn't, isn't going to have any extra vigor than anything else. Um, GMOs, just, I put it here to say it's different from hybrids. It's made in a lab. Um, it's, uh, they take the DNA out of one organism and put it in the cell of another organism. So it's, hybrids is a totally natural method and this is a totally synthetic and laboratory based method. Um, an heirloom is just an o older open pollinated variety. It often means it really should mean a variety that is, has been stewarded by a family or a group of people or a farm um, for a long time. Um, and a land race is an, an interesting term and a good term to know. It's basically a very diverse open pollinated variety. And the advantage of that is that you're able to save seed. Um, you're able to, there's a lot of genetic variation in there. So it's adaptable and it's resilient. You know, it, if, your, if your climate conditions change, there's maybe most of the plants in the population aren't going to do well, but, but there's enough variation that, that one or two of them will do well, and then you can start selecting for those. Um, and land races really is the way um, farming has mostly happened until uh, till the modern era, is that people would have more variable varieties and keep doing selection. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Now some of these slides I got, um, I did a seed saving talk last year with Michaela Colley from Organic Seed Alliance and I asked her if I could use some of her slides for um, some of the, this technical stuff. Um, 
So, let's see. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about about flower biology and and just basically um, the biology of of the the flower and the way it's pollinated has a lot to do with um, how we save seed from it. So some flowers some some flowers are prone to um, or not just prone to but they they need to cross with other plants to um, to to set seed. Um, and then some, some flowers, um, they have both the male and the female parts in the flower, and that one flower can just pollinate itself. Um, so tomatoes are, are like this, beans are like this, um, um, lettuce is like this. Um, so what that means, when you have a flower that has both the male and the female parts, is that it can pollinate itself, but some of these also can cross. Um, and so that informs things like isolation distance um, that you need to maintain your seed crops. Um, so squash is something that uh, the male and the female flowers are separate. Um, and the same plant will have both male and female flowers. So you are able to um, take a male flower and um, pollinate a female flower on that same plant. Um, often, often, flo often flowers of this type will um, require a bigger isolation distance and often a bigger population to maintain seed with. Um, I, I haven't really worked with much that uh, many plants that have separate uh, male and female plants. Um, I'm probably not really going to cover it, but... Okay. Let's see. I'm going to pass that one. Mm. I think I'm missing a slide somewhere. All right, I'm going to move on to this. Um, so here we have um, the spectrum of sulfurs and crossers. Um, and like I was saying, the, the, the perfect flowers with the male and female um, on the same plant are sulfurs. And when, or on this, in the same flower are sulfurs. And when the male and female flowers are separate, it tends to be crossers. Um, and so this is a useful chart because it basically shows you that there's a continuum and there's two issues on, on here. There's the question of isolation distance, which is down at the bottom. Um, how far away does your crop need to be from other varieties of the same type of plant? And then this, this row tells you how many plants do you need um, to maintain healthy genetics in your population. Um, I don't agree with some of these numbers. Um, I think, for instance, that you can use a lot less than 60 plants for squash, but it, it just gives you an idea of, uh, of the spectrum between sulfurs like peas and extreme crossers like corn and brassicas. Um, it's important, um, it's really important to have a lot of plants for corn and broccoli and cabbage. Um, otherwise, you get, um, you get genetic problems in the population. You lose vigor and um, so forth. Okay. So seed processing. Um, there's two basic kinds of seed processing, wet processing and dry processing. Wet processing, basically, you're taking a fruit and you're getting the seeds out of it. You're often doing something like mashing it, 
fermenting it. And then um, I'm going to have a demonstration about this later. But you ferment it, and then the basic principle is that the seeds will sink to the bottom and everything else will float. And you can separate the seeds from everything else that way. Um, dry process crops, um, usually what you're doing is separating the seeds from the pods and then either screening or winnowing them to get them clean. Um, and let's see. So in the southeast, um, wet process crops are some of the, um, I guess, kind of the easiest to do because we have such high humidity and a lot of rainfall. Um, and, and the heat that we have here is conducive to producing cucurbit crops and nightshade crops. Um, whereas in a region like the Northwest, um, they have really dry summers, so it's great for getting um, great quality lettuce seed and beans and spinach, but it's not very good for maturing um, watermelons or peppers. Um, and uh, let's see, it was funny. I, I went to, there's a seed growing conference put on by Organic Seed Alliance um, in the, the Northwest every two years. And I went to this conference, and it's a great conference. But I noticed that they were very much focusing on all these crops that I haven't had a lot of experience with. Um, stuff like spinach and beets and um, onions and um, all these dry seeded crops that I, as a production seed grower, I haven't worked with that much. Um, so. I guess what I want to say about this is that I'm interested in saving all kinds of seeds, including dry, dry, dry process crops that are a little bit difficult for our region. Um, as a production, as a seed producer, um, I have been tended to be more interested in the seeds that, you know, that yield that that produce enough seed for us to sell and do do a good job, um, you know, make enough money to sustain us that way. Um, but now, as I'm getting into seed retail, and I'm starting to think about seed systems and seed movements, um, I really want to figure out how to produce just about every kind of crop in our region so that we can be working with and adapting um, all kinds of crops. Um, and uh, just some examples about um, the challenges you face with, with uh, dry process crops. For instance, lettuce. Um, it, uh, when, the, when it's going to flower, it has these delicate flowers and the seeds fall off easily. And if you get a heavy rain, it'll mess up your lettuce crop. Now, one way to deal with this is to grow the lettuce seed in a hoop house. So you can do lettuce outside here, but you, you get better seed if you grow it under some kind of cover. So this is just one simple way that we can be producing lettuce seed here um, and, and still sort of maintain the feedback loops we need to be able to have varieties that are um, really adapted for our region. Anyone have any questions? OK. Um, so this is a slide from Organic Seed Alliance. And I just kept it in here because um, to address the question of how is seed growing different from produce growing. Um, so I would say it's more similar than not. You know, a lot of, a lot of what you're doing is, is you're, you're growing the produce uh, like you would. But then there's um, elements that are pretty different. For instance, when you grow lettuce, you know, it's, the heads are 10 inches apart and the rows are close together. But when you're growing lettuce for seed, you know, you've got um, looks like a four foot row there. Um, and so you, you need a lot more space to produce a biennial seed crop like lettuce. Um, sometimes it's good to have extra space for airflow. It keeps seed from getting moldy. Um, timing is different. You know, if you're, um, if you're producing cucumbers for, for produce, um, 
maybe you're, uh, you know, you're, you're harvesting the cucumbers and then you can disc the crop under. But if you're, if you're um, producing seed, it's going to be out there for an extra six weeks. And so maybe there's a weed control issue that would pop up um, because the plants are out there for so much longer. Um, so that's kind of something to think about. Um, and on the, on the issue of weed control, it's really important in seed saving because if you're, if you're sort of wading through a sea of weeds to get your lettuce seeds, you're going to end up with weed seeds in the bucket with the lettuce seeds, and, and we don't want that. So uh, weed control is even more important with, um, with uh, seed production. I have a question for you all. How many of y'all are interested in like, s um, seed saving for your home garden? OK. And how, is anybody here interested in like, seed production to sell seeds? OK. OK. Um, so this is going to be a little bit more, this presentation is a little more slanted towards, you know, we're a farm and we produce seeds. And, um, but I want to make sure that I cover things in a way that you can do it um, in your home garden. So, you know, um, some of the stuff I was talking about here, um, you know, there's optimal ways to do it, but then there's also like, well, I, I wasn't planning for this to be a seed crop, but now I really liked it and I'm going to let it go to seed. And, you know, there's just a lot more room to play around with it. And so I, I don't want to like deter people from that by this kind of presentation. Um, so now I'm going to get into pictures from our farm. Um, and this is just sort of showing a little bit of the course of the season. This is our greenhouse with nightshades. Uh, mostly nightshades. Um, this is hoeing some little rows of uh, okra. Direct sown. I do a lot of direct sown stuff. That's our cultivating tractor. These are some small lima beans, um, and these are some big lima beans. With a, this is a really nice um, intersown clover. Are these crops being sown for seed? These are all being sown for seed. Um, yeah, and, and while I'm going through this, I should just give you a little information about our operation. We grow on about six acres. Um, we grow for a half dozen different small seed companies, um, now including Commonwealth Seed Growers, which is the retail cooperative I'm part of. Um, and we are at an intentional community called Twin Oaks. Um, this is one of the businesses there. Twin Oaks is, it's 100 people living together and sharing income. So we have several community businesses and seed growing is one of them. Um, so there's a few things that makes that, makes our farm a little different, which is we have um, more flexible labor. Basically, um, when we need extra help, we just put a note up and, and can often get extra help that way. Um, and we're not paying people. Pe it's just that people have to fulfill a certain amount of labor requirement to live there. Um, and something else is that we have a kitchen that feeds 100 people. So a lot of the um, byproducts of some of our seed crops can get um, used in the kitchen. And the best crops for this, for us, are um, winter squash, peppers, and cantaloupe melons, because you can get the seeds out and then eat the produce. So these are really good crops for us. Um, but sometimes we'll even have such a big crop of cantaloupes or even winter squash that we can't, we can't eat them all. And, and we, you know, we end up having to throw stuff away or throw it to the chickens or compost it, I mean. Um, and and then sometimes there's crops that we grow as a seed crop, but there's some problem with it. We don't end up saving the seed, and that can go to the kitchen also. So uh, these are peanuts. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about peanuts, but um, 
southern exposure seed exchange sells peanuts and we we grow a decent amount of the of peanuts for them and we're harvesting them by hand we don't have uh, peanut equipment uh, it's okra we um we started doing for a couple years we did these large-scale okra grow outs um, and we were processing them with our neighbor's combine and then the second year that we did it, um, the combine was set too fast and it damaged all the seed. We couldn't sell it. It was, it was really terrible because it was a lot of okra picking and okra is painful to pick. Um, it's just some small peppers. It's a small, small pepper grow out. Sometimes our grow outs are very small. Um, doesn't, you know, a company might only want half a pound or a pound of pepper seeds sometimes. Small tomato grow out. This is just a pretty sunflower that I had to put in here. Um, <laughs> so it's called beach sunflower. I really like it. Um, so now I'm going to. Any questions about our farm? Do you walk on the clover and it just like bounces back? You know, it's like a cushion. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it handles traffic pretty well, the clover. And uh, yeah, you looking at the inner zone clover. This was like perfect timing. You, if, you, if you throw down the clover and it rains soon, you can get a really good stand of clover. So I was like really proud of this. But one thing I found out with clover is that in the summer, um, there's a lot of annual grass to compete with, and annual grass is one of our worst weeds. So I've kind of gone away from using clover, from keeping clover over the summer. But So I'm going to get into some slides about wet seed processing. And we're going to see a lot of this again when we do demonstrations. Um, basically, we, we use a lot of really simple methods and tools. Um, is this story about five years ago I went um, I was visiting family in Colorado and I wanted to I had this idea that I wanted to see bigger seed processing farms and get some ideas of what kind of equipment and machinery they were using and the farm I picked to go to is called uh, Abandonza farm there's a amazing seed seed grower named Rich Pecoraro um, and and he was doing he was doing a lot more seeds than I, than I am. But I got there and he was using all simple equipment. He he, I was like, so where's your equipment? Like he was like, oh here's a fan and here's like this special table that I use for this thing and here's how I mash things. Here's how I like here's the tarp that I like use to winnow things. Um, so you can do a lot with without that much fancy equipment, but it takes thought, uh, you know. There's still a lot of room for innovation with simple stuff. Um, with tomatoes, for instance, we've gone through a lot of different methods for how to process our tomatoes. Um, we, we used to sit, sit and cut out the cores of the, you know, we do a lot of big heirloom tomatoes. We cut out the cores of each one because we thought the cores were a pain to deal with during the fermentation, I mean, during the cleaning process. And then we'd mash it. Um, and that was seen to be taking a while. And then we started using an immersion blender. And it wasn't hurting the seeds, so we were happy about that. We thought, like, well, we can get them mashed up really fast with this big blender. Um, and, but then we realized that the blender cut up the tomato skin into little pieces, and it was harder to separate the little pieces of skin out. Um, so anyway, we went back to mashing, and then we realized that we really didn't even need to cut the cores out. It was just they weren't that hard to deal with. Um, and so this is just a, a, a square, square board and a bucket. And you can get a lot done that way. Um, these are ferments. Um, let's see, it's mostly tomatoes. That's a pepper. Um, People know what a ferment is. I mean, in the context of seeds. Not in the context of seeds. Yeah. Okay. 
So we're going to look, we're going to have more demonstration about it and talk about it in a more hands-on way, but um, most wet processed seed crops um, do well being fermented, and some of them have to be fermented. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're mashing up the, you're mashing up the fruit, you're putting it in a bucket or a container. If you're, if you're a home gardener, your container might be a little cut. Um, so this is a scale that you guys are probably maybe not going to be using. Um, and so you mash it up, and then you let it ferment for a few days. Um, each type of crop has different considerations with the ferment. Um, tomatoes, I usually let sit for about two days, but it, it depends on the temperature. Um, you know, you get into the, if you're doing tomato seed saving in the late, you know, in October, you would let it sit longer. Um, peppers don't really need to be fermented, but it helps with the processing. Um, and I, if you let them sit too long, the seeds will start to sprout. Um, so usually it's one day or less for peppers. Um, and cucurbit ferments can often go longer if you, uh, you know, uh, are more flexible with when you process them. So with cucurbits, it'll be from two to four days. And then sometimes when I'm doing winter squash ferments in the winter, I'll let them sit for a couple of weeks because it's so cold, they're not really fermenting very fast. And, and uh, that'll help break down the pulp so that it's a lot easier to process. We are going to do some winter squash seed processing of, uh, from a winter squash that hasn't been fermented. And you'll see what's difficult about that. So when you, when you ferment it, you break down the pulp, it's easier to separate. Um, and then there's a couple kinds of ferments, tomatoes and cucumbers. They actually have a, a gel coating on the seed, and the fermentation is necessary to break that coating down. Otherwise, there'll be this, this coating that dries on the seed that actually prevents germination. So fermentation is, is an important part of the, is an essential part of the process for some seeds. And it's, for other seeds, it's just a good way to break down, um, break down the, the non-seed material. So one other thing about, um, about wet seed processing, um, and we'll see this when we go outside, but basically the principle that the good seeds sink and the pulp and the not good seeds will float. So it's a good way to, um, you know, work with water to get better quality seeds when you're cleaning them. So this is another method um, that we've started using more, and I'm going to show you this. Um, basically, this is a pepper ferment. Um, you pour it out on the, this is quarter inch hardware cloth. You pour out the mashed peppers onto the hardware cloth and spray it with the hose to get the seeds down into the bin. It's a very, it's a pretty fast way to separate pepper seeds. Um, and it's very good for hot peppers that you don't want to touch. That said, on a home scale, um, you might not need to be doing doing this. <laughs> you know, you could just cut open the pepper and take the seeds out, and maybe that's all you're going to do. The one advantage of wet, wet seed processing with peppers um, is that the, the not good seeds will float, so you get better quality seed if you um, do wet processing with peppers. Um, this is a ferment pour. So basically, it looks like um, it looks like it's it's not the first pour. It's been rinsed a couple times, but basically, um, you let's say you have half a bucket full of cucumber pulp and seeds, uh, or let's say you have a quarter bucket. You fill the rest of that with water, um, and then you pour off most of that water, and most of the pulp will come out, and then you'll have nice seeds in the bottom with a little bit of pulp. Then you fill that up with water again and pour it. It'll get cleaner and cleaner. And um, Depending on the seed, you might do that from two times to eight times. Some things are harder to clean than others. 
Um, so you've got your seeds sitting in the bottom of the bucket. The next step is to dry them. And this is how we do drying. Um, it's, I kind of wish I had a better picture, but um, we've got these, we've, we made these screens to put the seeds on um, and then a rack to put the screens in. And then we have a fan, um, we have a fan way over here that blows air across. Um, and it's, the whole thing is put in a dehumidified room. So this is a way that we can dry a whole lot of seeds. Um, now on a home scale, you might just be, um, you know, you might be drying seeds on a piece of paper, or you might be um, just setting out a small amount of seeds on a table in front of a fan. Um, there's a lot of different scales. Um, one really good one that we used to use a lot, um, but we we kind of switched to this method, but it's still really good for small scale. Are you guys familiar with row cover? Um, you uh, get, cut a little piece of row cover, put the seeds in it, and tie it up like a little bag, and then hang it in front of a box fan. It's a really good way to dry a small quantity of seeds. We used to have these fans that had all kinds of seeds hanging all over them. Um, Huh, I don't know why this is here. <laughs> Gourds. <laughs> I guess that these are just more wet processing related uh, pictures. So gourds, um, I think this was a crop maybe three years ago, and it got me really into gourds. Um, because we were n not only able to get the seeds, we were able to do all kinds of crafts with them. Um, but gourds can actually be dry or wet seed processed. You have to let them cure. You harvest them after frost. You let them cure until the middle of winter. Um, if you can shake the gourd and hear a sloshing, or a sloshing sound, you can process the gourd and use a wet seed processing method. If you um, and then if you wait a couple months more, you shake the gourd and it rattles, um, then you can just cut it open and the seeds will be dry. Um, and uh, again, the wet seed processing method will allow you to sink the good ones and float the bad ones. But um, if you do the dry processing method, you can just winnow it, which I will show you later. Um, these are... Um, uh, it's a seed crop of seminal pumpkin grown on a neighboring farm um, and they're just letting these cure. Um, some of them were brought in at frost because um, frost was coming. You can see they're a little bit green. Uh, this is a variety that they're actually sweet when they still have a little green on them. But they're letting these cure um, because the longer you let it cure, um, the seeds keep maturing, so you get fatter, better quality seeds. Um, curing is an important part of wet seed processing often. It's just scooping watermelon in the field. This is a variety I like called Chilean black seeded. Um, I grew it last year. It's really sweet. It's a little bit seedy. It's really resistant to downy mildew, but it's also really susceptible to anthracnose. So I'm actually not as excited about it, but I want to do breeding work with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, our ideal process for that is to go out in the field, clip them, um, and this would be like several days when we know that it's not supposed to rain. We'll clip them, we'll put them in piles or in rows um, with the stems facing up, um, and then we'll come back. And so they'll sit out in the sun for several days, and then we'll come back um, and pick them up and put them in bins, and that's enough curing. Now, we mostly work with Machado variety squashes, um, so I know that Maxima squashes are a little different. They maybe don't want to sit out in the sun so much because they can get sunburnt. Um, 
and then when you're when you're dealing when you're harvesting squash at frost or maybe there's a storm coming in and you want to get out of the field or, or whatever sometimes you can't do that process and then ideally you would bring it into a warm space to cure but if you have a stem if you just clip the stem and you harvest it and you bring it in it's going to be dripping from the stem and potentially molding um, so you would have to find an in indoor space where that stem was able to heal and dry um, yeah with watermelon sometimes we process it in the field sometimes we bring it home and make watermelon juice out of it and, and really maybe with this variety I was trying to really take my time to select for sweetness and lack of seediness so I was sort of Cutting them all open, looking at each one, tasting each one. So. This is some watermelon ferment. These are some watermelon ferments. Um, there's a lot of it. One thing about watermelon is that a lot of times the good seeds will float. So we've had to look for ways to deal with that issue, separating the pulp from the seeds when the seeds are floating. Um, and we've actually used the quarter inch hardware cloth a lot, um, but in the opposite way that we did with the peppers. Basically, we pour, we pour, we'll pour like half a bucket onto some hardware cloth and then work the pulp through with our hands and then you just have the seeds on top. And then you can um, continue to clean that. And once you get most of the pulp out, the seeds will end up sinking usually. Because what happens is that the seeds get sort of caught up in the pulp and they just, they don't sink. This is just, this is a squash harvest. This is after they've dried down. This was actually years, this was like five years ago when I was just really starting to do a lot of winter squash and I actually didn't let this dry long enough and I had problems with the stems. Um, it's a cucumber seed crop. So you're letting your cucumbers get really yellow. Um, and really, like, a lot of times we don't start processing the seed until some of them are, are, are starting to rot um, because that, that's the way to have seed that's the most um, filled out and mature. This is a zucchini seed crop. Uh, this variety had a really hard shell and we had to, I think we were mash, we would take a masher and break each one and then scoop it out. It's some more fun with watermelons. So we, these are all empty shells of watermelons we've processed in the field. And that's more of that. Um, okay. These, so this is when we harvest peppers, we'll often, if it's a large quantity, we'll put them in these boxes and let them sit for like three days. It just lets them get a little bit, bit, little bit more ripe and the seeds have a chance to get um, a little bit more mature. You don't want to leave them so long that they start to rot because pepper seed cavities are very susceptible to mold and rot. Um, but yeah, this is not, you wouldn't want to do this if this was, you know, like the peppers will sit out in these boxes and get a little softer, a little softer than you would want them to get if you're going to sell them, but they're still edible. It's just pepper. Uh, it's a really nice variety called bullnose. Excited about. Um, so this is processing a pepper, a bell pepper for seed. Um, I find that with small peppers, I often mash them and, and then use this hardware cloth method. But with bell peppers, um, for two reasons, I'll cut, cut out the core. One of the reasons is that I want to eat the pepper. And then the other reason is that for some reason, bell peppers are much more susceptible to mold and like other issues with the seed. So I really like to look at each core. Um, bell pep it makes bell peppers harder to produce seed for on a, you know, on a farm scale, but it's, um, 
but you get to eat the peppers, so that's great. Very much. That's just some nice tomatoes. That's a yellow brandy one. I was like really excited about that harvest. Um, and that's some tomatoes after the Septorian early blight has hit them. So, um, you know, where we're at, we don't get much late blight, like like I guess you guys do get down here. So I haven't been able to do any kind of selection or screening or trialing for late blight. I, um, but I am starting to do some trialing for early blight and septoria resistance. Um, and this is a very susceptible variety. That really died early. That crop from last year. Um, this is curing tomatoes. So just like the squash, tomatoes can benefit from, from curing. Um, and we, we have this, uh, we've had, we've developed kind of an elaborate process with tomatoes because we were having trouble getting good enough germination with our tomatoes. So we, we, we started really curing some of them, and then ones that we would harvest that would be, if they had a split in it or something, we wouldn't cure them, but we'd keep it in a separate lot so that we could test both lots separately. Um, and uh, that's a bucket of tomatoes that is about to be mashed with the, with the board. Um, this is our, uh, our seed processing room used to be a rope making room, and this is a rope making machine. <laughs> In case they ever need to get it up and running again, we, we have left it there. Um, these are pictures from another farm. This is from Organic Seed Alliance's um, presentation, or Michaela's presentation. Um, and this is just some other ways people do, dry seed, do wet seed processing, larger containers, um, this is a tomato ferment. I guess some people, some people will just let their ferment sit and not stir them, and, and then they develop mold and they'll just scrape the mold off. What we do is that we stir it twice a day so it doesn't form mold. Um, but in any case, it's important to, if you, um, in seed production where you're trying to get seeds that'll germinate at a certain percent, um, the mold can be something that the presence of mold will lower the germination quality of the seed, this is especially with tomatoes. So um, I like the stirring method. And we, we realized that we really had to do it twice a day at even intervals. Um, this is some ferment pouring. Uh, you can see there's like clean seeds after, after all the washing and processing has been done. Uh, this is one way to mash up squash. <laughs> I haven't done it. This is another way. Oh wait, this is another way. Um, it's like a. It, I think it leaves a pretty big gap, so it doesn't actually crush the seeds at all, and then it spins them and the seeds come out of the holes in this contraption. Um, I'm not sure where this picture is from. I think it, it could be, maybe it's high mowing seeds, but I'm not positive. Um, okay, so now that's wet seed processing. Does people have any questions about that? We are gonna cover that again when we do demonstrations. So. Um, so a little bit of dry seed processing. Um, what time is it? Anyone? 6.35. Okay, great. Plenty of time. Um, this is, this is from a few years ago. I forget what crop it is exactly. It's, it's a turnip. Um, but that's, it's gone. You know, it's uh, the seed is not ready to harvest, but it's set. The pods have been set mostly. This is harvest. Um, I think what we often do is we'll. Oh. 
early in the season, like the plants will um, get mature at, at a, not all at once. So, you know, some of the branches will start maturing and you want to get out there with the small clippers and get, get those branches. But then later on, you'll, the, whole, the whole plant will, will sort of turn dry and then you can just go clip the whole plant. And then we'll take it and uh, pile it up on a tarp and transport it, transport the tarp back to you, like a greenhouse where we can dry it. Um, and then from there, um, we'll winnow it. No, we'll thresh it and winnow it, which I'll talk more about during the demonstration. Um, beans. Um, actually, this is cow peas. Um, we have normally done a lot more cow peas and limas than than regular garden beans because we just have a whole we have really bad bean beetles, um, so it just worked better for us to do, to not do a lot of regular beans. But we've done a lot of cow peas. Um, this is a variety called Pink Eye Purple Hole. Um, and we pick them by hand. Um, one of the things about growing seeds, bean seeds in the east, is that for a lot of varieties, if you just let them sit in the field until all the rest, if you let the early harvest sit in the field until the rest of the beans are all ripe, the early ones will get moldy. So you have to go through it several times and pick them. And it also makes it not as not very conducive to mechanical harvest because they're not all ripening at the same time. Um, so it's one of the challenges of growing in a wet, humid area. Um, there are some varieties that either resist mold on the seed or that mature um, more all at once. And those could probably be mechanically harvested in the east. Some more bean picking. Actually, this is a variety that sets seed over a lot longer period. It's called whippoorwill. But for some, you know, for a home gardener, maybe they want cowpeas that set seed over six or eight weeks rather than a variety that sets all its seed over a week and a half. Um, so these are all questions that I have about cowpeas. Like, do people want stuff that matures over a long period? Is it possible to really do selection to have beans that resist molding during the seed, seed drying stage? Um, so we take the beans from the field. We put them on these tables in our hoop house. Um, we have a tarp over the hoop house to keep it from being excessively hot in the summer. Um, you, you wouldn't. In the fall, you wouldn't have to have a tarp at all. Um, so, yeah. And they'll sit on these tables for a couple of weeks. And uh, I don't have a picture, but what we'll often what we'll do is is take them off of the table and put them in um, boxes. Like we have these big, like two foot by two foot boxes that will put, we'll put the, the pods in after they're dry, and then we can just put those boxes away, aside somewhere until, um, until the middle of the fall when we're not busy with the rest of the harvest. Um, and then we'll, and then we'll process them. And this, this is a threshing party that we had a few years ago. This is actually, we actually have tried this a couple times. This is the only one that really worked well. Um, but there was a big group of people visiting the community and um, we had a threshing party and this is just, so you put the beans out, you run around on them, jump on them, go like, go like that. And, um, after five or 10 minutes, depending on how many beans and how many people they'll, all the beans will be separated from the pods. Um, and then you can, um, you can blow the pods, the empty pods, away using a fan. Um, unfortunately, I'd, we're not growing beans this year. 
and I wasn't able to actually bring a bean demonstration. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit more about it here. Um, there's a step in between these two steps, which is um, that when you've done this, the beans will be lower down, like sort of below all the, um, the pods. Um, and then you gather them all up together and you're able to sort of pick up a lot of the pods that don't have beans in them before you even get to the winnowing step. So that, that makes the winnowing a little easier. Um, and I really, I really like doing threshing with feet. It's really fast and um, easy. You can also shell the beans by hand if you only have a few, you know, if you don't have a lot. Um, you have to be careful with some kinds of seeds. Um, let's say if you were to do this on a concrete surface with some <laughs> kinds of seeds, it might damage the seed. So I, d I usually don't like to do it straight on a concrete surface. Um, this is, I believe this is Worcester Indian Red Pole Lima, which I have some of out there on the table. Could someone go out to the table and get the big uh, jar of lima beans? The big red, the red limas. The big jar, yeah. Anyway, that's what those are. It's a really pretty red lima bean. Oh, wait. It's a really pretty red lima bean. Um, and this here, you can see some of the pods got into it. You often need to win it. You often need to run things past the fan several times to get it totally clean. And then even then, you might need to pick through it a little bit. Um, corn, this is Tennessee red cob corn. Um, corn is pretty straightforward. You just wait till it dries. Like if, if um, you, you harvest it in a similar way to how you would harvest it to eat it as a, as a flour corn or, or a cornmeal corn. Um, of course, if you're growing sweet corn, it's, your harvest is going to be very different from how it would be normally. Um, that's Tennessee red cob, it's a really good harvest. One thing about um, seed growing harvest on a bigger scale is that you don't, a combine um, will take all the corn off the ears um, during the harvest procedure. And usually when you're doing, if you're doing, um, corn for seed, you don't want that. You want to be able to look at the ears more and maybe do a selection for the ones that look better or see if there's any off types or whatever. So you, you want to harvest it in a way that the corn is on the ear. So our neighbor who does corn seed um, on a bigger scale than us uses a corn picker instead of a combine. But we just pick it by hand. Um, this is Tithonia. Um, we do a little bit of flower seed crops, not a whole lot. Uh, we mostly do vegetables, but these, um, most flowers are dry seeded. And usually what you wanna do is harvest it when the stem has started to turn brown. So you can see that stem is green, uh, but this stem is, turning, is brown. So when the stems turn brown, Sometimes when they're just barely starting to turn brown, um, when the stems turn brown, you can come in and either pick them or clip them or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense for home gardeners to, to harvest their dry seeded flowers like this because it doesn't take a lot to plant your new flower bed. This is harvesting peanuts by hand. Um, have, have you all grown peanuts? 
Yeah. Uh, what we do is we, we fork them, we, we pull the plants out of the ground, shake off the dirt, turn them upside down, and let them sit there for a few days to dry out, and then we come and pick them by hand. Um, so it's a kind of labor-intensive way to do it, but we get um, a good enough price for them that it makes sense for us to do it. Because um, it's just like peanut seed for home gardeners. Um, so the scale doesn't need to be that big. This is the combine that we use to thresh the okra that I was talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, we had these okra contracts that were like 500 pounds of seed and 600 pounds of seed. And uh, we had to clip the okra by hand because it, it ripens at different times um, over a period of five or six weeks. And we dried it on the tables and we put it in these boxes that I was talking about before. And we brought it out here and threw it into the combine. Um, we did it for two years. And one year we had pretty good results. It was pretty efficient. And then the second year, the combine was set too fast and it damaged the seed. We weren't able to sell it. And I'm not sure which year this picture is from. Um, these are some, some uh, dry processing pictures from another farm. Um, if you have dry weather, you can, you can do a lot of your drying out, outside. Um, so if you know you have, you know, just look at the forecast and if it's dry, you can, can use this kind of method. Um, Do you know what that is there? Okay. I don't know what that is. Looks like, some, no, I don't know. Radish maybe? Um, and that's a, you know, that's a whole lot more green. I don't even know what crop that is. Similar process to what we do in the, in the greenhouse. Uh, this is a, a simple threshing project. Um, so screening is another method um, besides winnowing for cleaning seeds and we have a, a I think I'll be able to do a screening demonstration. Um, so there's a machine called a clipper. Where is it? This is a huge version of a clipper. They make ones that are like this big. <laughs> and they make ones that are like this big. But this is a huge one. Basically, it screens the seed and winnows the seed at the same time. But it only works for... Um, well, I guess it, it, it can work for a lot of kinds of seeds, but it can be delicate to adjust the screen size to the right size. And we actually don't have a clipper to use right now because there was a fire at our neighbor's place that had a clipper that we used to use. It's another huge clipper. Um, this is um, some sort of stepped up winnowing methods. Um, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna show you winnowing with one fan, but some people like to use two fans because it, it makes the air flow a little bit more constant. Um, some people like to winnow back, like winnow using the back of the fan instead of the front of the fan. Um, and these folks, have a machine that shakes the seeds out so you're not so you're not standing with a bucket it's it's letting the seeds out in front of the fans for you um, which you can see that's happening here um, okay this is just another this is another piece of fancy equipment this is a spiral um, and basically, it's a way to separate round seeds from not round seeds. So you can take these grain and peas, I, I'm not sure what that is, and separate them because the, the round seeds will roll all the way to the bottom and the, the ones that aren't round won't roll. 
Uh, it's just a really cool device, and you can see the difference in the seed. But, um, yeah. Okay. So I'll leave this up here for uh, for a minute. Um, I brought um, I brought a lot of books and and some other um, pamphlets um, for you all to look through. That's on the table out there, um, and except I didn't bring enough for you to take with you, but um, just take this information down. Um, Jeff McCormick's seed saving guides are online for free, and I really recommend them. There's one, there's one for cucurbits, brassicas. Uh, does everyone know what brassicas is? Cucur okay, cucurbits, brassicas, peppers, tomatoes, isolation distance, seed storage, um, and they're focused on the southeast region. Um, I really recommend that. There's a lot of good seed saving information on both of these websites. Um, and then these are, um, these are reference books about seed saving and seed growing. And these are, um, Carol Deppie's books are great. They're more about breeding um, and selection and crosses and a lot of interesting stories and ideas in there. I wonder if we should stop and, and do some, take a break and maybe do some hands-on stuff and then come back to this. You ready? So normally, or lately at least since, since we had trouble with the combine method, we've been um, processing our okra by hand just by going like this. I also like it because it's, it's an easy thing to show new people how to do. It's good for rainy days. It's good when you ran out of other tasks. Um, but we've also done, um, um, we have done foot threshing of okra before as well. It takes a little while. Um, but I wanted to do it today because I don't have any beans to show people foot threshing of. So I thought we could thresh this okra and then winnow it and you just get a sense of the usual process that you would use for beans or actually a lot of uh, brassica crops as well. You can do this. Um, so I actually need like a few people to run, run around on the okra for, <laughs> it could be like, it might take a little while. <laughs> no, seed feet are better. <laughs> and try to like smash them. Okay. This is going to probably actually take like 10 minutes. Try to like go like that. I think hitting them sideways is like helpful, like that.
And then, is there anything that you're threshing? You pick it up and look at it. And are you finding seeds still in the pods? If you are, you got to keep going. <laughs> and like I said, we okra takes a while. It's debatable whether this is the best method. <laughs> um, but keep going, I guess. Are you guys finding seeds in there? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Found some. Yeah, they're like grading, like sort of grading is really good. Best way. How's it looking for y'all? Okay. Not, so, not as many remaining. Just mm -hmm. a little bit. What do you think? Okay. Okay, I think we can stop. <laughs> right, what do you think? There's still something. Yeah, there, there is definitely still something. It depends how thorough the extraction you want. Let's do another minute. <laughs> Does anybody else want to do this? <laughs> There's also diminishing returns. Yeah. After a while, you know, you get to 98% and then you, you could you could keep going, but you're not really going to get much. Okay, let's just... We probably got... Did pretty good. There's a couple. Um, okay, so... Let's, let's all pick up a corner and sort of get them into the middle. Okay, now, here's you got that purple bin. Great. So we can pick up the, the pods. So when you pick stuff up, you kind of shake it. And, you know. and again, this is like, this is how you do beans. Just didn't have any beans today to show you. Um, and so how long did this okra dry for? How did it so this okra was picked on September 10th. Okay. And so it hasn't dried, yeah, it's dried like two weeks. A lot of times I would not be doing this so soon just because I would wait till I was less busy time okay. in the season, but two weeks is long enough. Okay. Um, unless it was like raining the whole time, in which case, you know, even it, even in the greenhouse, it's just not going to dry that well. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then now, let's take. It's gonna be a little tricky. Um, let's slip this tarp and. Oh wait, we have a different. Could you get that other bin? <clears throat> so, one other person, let's lift the tarp and get these poured into the bin. Great. 
Um, so now, um, actually, maybe we need to put these back on the tarp because I need this bin. Um, and we're going to do a winnowing demonstration. Um, I'm going to do it at that table. So I put these in the bin just because it was easy to get them poured into the bin. But to winnow them, I want them in a bucket. Um, shoot, could someone plug in that extension cord and run it out here? on the table. Um, I think people should stand over there so you can see what's going on. Um, <coughs> for large, heavy seeds, I will often use a little bit heavier duty of a fan than this, um, but this should work okay. Um, so you get bins. It's nice to have one that's a little bit taller than the other, but if they're the same height, you just sort of overlap the near one over the far one. Um, the first bin is where your best seed is going to go. And then a lot of the trash will be blown off this way. We may or may not get sort of a grade B seed in here. We'll see how that goes. One thing about winnowing is that it's, it's different for every crop and every, every time you do it, it's different. And so you start pouring, and as you start pouring, you get a sense of what's going on. Um, and uh, so notice how I sort of had to adjust where the bucket was after I got started and I was, what I was going for is that I wanted the seed to be landing right here because I wanted any, anything, I wanted to keep most of the seed, but I wanted anything else to be gone. So including maybe some of the seed if it wasn't quite as good. Um, shaking is, helps it come out more evenly. Somebody else want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no. Okay. It's okay if you know. <laughs> you want to shake, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> I want to 
do the whole bucket. You could do the whole bucket. You could do the whole bucket. So, um, let's come look at what we have. It's a lot cleaner. It's mostly seed. I'll probably want to do it one more time just to get it totally clean. This is really some pretty good seed. Um, this is a piece of bark that fell in there. So. <laughs> um, it's pretty good seed, or it's really good seed. Um, sometimes when you're picking okra and it's been a lot of rainy weather, you'll get stuff that looks a little moldy, or if it's late in the season, it starts to get a little moldy. Or, um, and when that happens, you get, you're gonna wanna be winnowing to not only remove the, um, the debris, but to remove seeds that aren't as good. And then you can actually see a few of these seeds here. Um, can see some sort of malformed immature seeds in there and this is the um, stuff we're going to throw out. Um, you also see some good seeds in here and the thing about winnowing um, you know this is such a good seed lot that it's almost not a great demonstration but um, let's say I had a seed crop that was like I wanted to get rid of about 10% of the seeds because there was about 10% of them weren't, weren't very good. Um, what would happen was that I would pour it, I would pour it here and I would get maybe 20% of the seeds in here and half of them would be good and half of them would be bad. And then I would, and then I would take the good stuff and I would do that again. You have to do it multiple times because some of the, it like, it will separate it but some of the good will end up in the bad bucket and some of the bad will still end up in the good bucket. So you have to do it multiple times. You know, you do this mul several times again and then you come to this one and, and you, maybe you do it a few times depending on how it looks and get the good seed that went in the bad bucket out. Um, but I, I guess we can just do it one more time and get it fully cleaned up. It also matters how far away the bins are from the fan and how high the fan is. Now if I wanted to be, if I was trying to separate out some of the, if some of the seeds were bad and I was trying to separate them out, I would want to I want the stream of seeds to be sort of over the edge like that. So some of them were going in the bad bucket, but I'm not trying to do that. And okra seeds really actually ought to have a little bit more powerful of a fan. Sometimes you'll have debris that's like a pebble or yeah, like a piece of bark or like you'll need to pick that out or you'll need to screen it to get stuff like that out. But this looks great. And um, have you guys ever smelled okra seed? It smells like candy. It really does. Right. The thing is, um, I don't know. 
It may. Uh, pro no, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and again, like, on a home scale, like, yeah, I wouldn't be doing okra this way at all. Um, but I wanted to show you this method because I think on a home scale, this really would be great for beans. You know, whether you're growing beans for seed or for, like, dry beans to eat, this is, like, a really simple method and you can get a lot done. Yeah. Um, it gets these splits on it, um, and when it, when it is most, when it has at least a few splits on the pod, it's ready to harvest. Okay. And do you have a dry input, like, a certain amount of time you let it dry before you do this? This was two weeks old, um, but it was nice dry conditions, so it could be a little longer if it was wetter. And is yeah. okra one that you would harvest earlier if you were going to eat? Yeah, yeah. I eating. The seed stage is a few weeks later than the eating stage. You would not want to eat it. <laughs> uh, although I've heard of people using okra seeds to brew like a coffee kind of beverage. I haven't done it. Um, okay, so we could try, um, there's some, this lettuce crop here, we could, that, um, that this was grown here, and we could try to see if we can process it. I don't have much experience with lettuce, so this will be kind of an experiment. Does that sound okay to people? Okay. Um, I'm actually growing. I grew my I grew my first lettuce seed crop this year, and I haven't Process. processed it yet. Yeah. So when I uh, when I harvested lettuce, I just I didn't clip the whole plant like this. I just, I, uh, I took the ends, I took the dry flowers and shook them into a bin, which is what I'll do now. It doesn't need to be threshed. Maybe it ought to be threshed. Will somebody get in the bin and stomp on that? <laughs> yeah. Now I just want, I don't want the main, I just want the, the bottom of the plant to get worked up. Step in it with your feet. Oh, yeah. Step in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I think lettuce doesn't need a whole lot of threshing. Yeah. I think I see some seed in there. So all this coarse stuff we can get out immediately. This is going to be a very small amount of lettuce seed. Um, and then dry bucket. I think the timing of when to harvest your lettuce is, is a big issue in the wet climate. Like, 
it's going to rain, you want to go get it. And also, I've seen people do like build little huts with clear plastic over their lettuce seed crop. I don't know. Or grow it in the hoop house. So this is much more delicate. Actually, I'm going to screen it first. So this is a screen that fits in one of those clipper machines I was telling you about. But it can also be used by itself. Um, and they come in all different sizes. There's, um, you can get a hundred different screens for one of these. They're kind of expensive though. But I just want to get out the biggest material here. Um, so this screen, hopefully it will help with that. So it, I got a lot of the core stuff out. <coughs> Definitely helpful. Uh, I think I see seed. Yeah, it's a white. It's a white colored seed. Oh, oh Put it back in the bucket. Um, this is going to be a lot more delicate than the okra. I don't know how much more, how delicate exactly. But I'll put the fan on the lowest setting and move the bins a little further away. Yeah, it's really delicate. What's that? Yeah. Good point. Good point. <laughs> I've never <laughs> used that much distance before. We have this little hand crank winnower that probably would have been good for this.
to screen it again. A smaller screen would probably be good. You can see it's mostly seed now, but there's these bigger particles. How much do you think you lost in that process? It looks like I lost some because it's not a really, I don't really have it set quite right. Um, but I'm trying to just get it, get some clean seed out of it to show. Um, Yeah, so really, you could have it again, sorry. Really, I ought to have a, a smaller screen and a more delicate window system. Anyway, it's mostly seeds, which is bigger particles. Um, if I had a little bit smaller screen, I could get all the big particles out. Yeah. I guess so. And then it looks like this bin still has some seed in it um, but at the same time it's like it's more likely to be lighter and less viable seed in this bin so if we're not actually trying to like maximize the amount that we're saving we might just not want to deal with this anymore um, so yeah I think That's what I'll do. Okay. There's um there's one other thing we could win now. Should we move to wet processing? Move to wet processing. Okay. Um, so, could some maybe someone could like pick up this tarp and move it. Yeah. Great. start with peppers. Um, and actually I wanted to, I kind of forgot the labeling piece. Labeling is really important. I'm going to put a label on the okra. Um, and uh, partly we're, we're, we're a certified organic farm, so we have to have harvest dates on everything. Um, but even if we didn't, it's good to know the harvest date. And um, for crops that we've had germination trouble with in the past, we'll keep different harvest dates separate. So in case there's something that we did, um, so basically it'll help us figure out what we're doing wrong based on which harvest date works and which doesn't. Um, and we'll be able to, even if half of the crop is bad, it won't be all mixed in with the good stuff. So. Um, we have um, each season, like when we get our contracts, I make a list of abbreviations for crops and then we'll use those. Um, so this is sweet bullnose. 
actually these are <laughs> these have a similar name. It's called sweet bullnose and the abbreviation is BUL. And then this is called sweet banana and the abbreviation is SWB. These are actually prone to a little bit of confusion, but the peppers look very different, at least. Um, and then we put the um, harvest date on them, which is September 24th. I, I like to not use any like dashes or s anything. And um, so part of what I want to show you is that the process for um, the difference between bell peppers and other peppers in the way that we process them. So for bell peppers, um, cut them open. Hopefully I'll find some with bad seeds in them so I can show you why we do this. But these have good looking seeds in them. They also have these weird little things. Which I don't know if that's something I should select away from or not. Maybe it is. Um, but the seeds look really good. They look really clean and nice. Um, so there'll be some here and there'll be some um, still in the pepper. And what we'll do um, I need a container. What we'll do is um, take this and put it in and then shake out the pepper. And then this goes into a bucket for the kitchen. Um, now you can't, usually you can't sell these like processed products, but you know, if you had a processing kitchen, you could do this in the processing kitchen and use this for something. Um, Right, they look pretty good again. It would be great if I could find some that don't look good. Here's some seeds that don't look very good. They kind of have brown spots on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of them also don't look very mature. Mm. Um, and so I'll know, so, um, I won't save seeds from that pepper. Sometimes if there's just a few weird looking ones, I'll like, scrape those off and then <coughs> um, and then save the good ones. But, um, but this is bad enough that I wouldn't like I wouldn't save a seed from that. And also I want to be selecting for peppers that have good looking seed. Um, but the pepper's still good for the kitchen. Um, and um, that's that. This is a variety called Sweet Bullnose that I really like, that we've been growing for a few years and selecting for. Um, selecting for productivity and large size and flavor. Um, it's really citrusy. Uh, so this Sweet Banana is a really productive pepper that is often used in the green stage. It's kind of light green. It's really prolific. I think it's used for pickling. Um, it's not a hot pepper, but the process I'm going to show you on it is similar to what we would use for a lot of hot peppers. Um, so we have these oak boards and you want to check it to like make sure it got cleaned up pretty good and there aren't seeds stuck in the cracks. Um, you know, if you wanted to eat the peppers too, you wouldn't use this method. <laughs> um, 
but it's labor intensive for smaller peppers. We're actually going to take this to the sink. Okay. Smash it a little bit more. It's getting pretty nicely smashed. No, like we can go out and do this whole demo by a hose oh, yeah. instead of in the sink. You cleared it, it's good? Okay. I'm gonna get out of here. We do have that. Okay. Right over there, there's definitely hose outside too. Okay, well if we're here and um where's the where's the great So we're mostly doing it here because it's a rainy day. Um, As strong as you can get it. Stronger. Good. And if it's hot peppers, you're not going to want to touch them. But. Or you'd want to use like a to stir them up instead. And then you just like, when you're hardly seeing any more seeds, you stop and you take this and um, goes to the compost, wherever that is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for this mess here. I should. We'll do the next thing outside. <laughs> Sometimes stuff gets stuck in the screen and you can hit it against the tree to get the stuff out. <laughs> um, okay, maybe, maybe someone could go do that, hit it against the railing or something. Um, so you get compost and then you get this um, bucket of, um, or this bin of ferment, and I'm going to take this up back outside to pour it. 
Um, okay. So, see, there's still a lot of pulp, and there's a lot of seeds floating. Those are probably not good seeds. And normally I would be pouring this into a system that takes the water away, not just into a bucket. So it's mostly seeds. Um, I'm going to do another rinse on that. Um, Yeah, we have a whole, like a, a ferment station with a drain and everything. Yeah, but if you're doing this on a home scale, you could just be doing this in a sink and it could be fine. So you can like sway it back and forth to help get the pulp out. Now I'm getting rid of some seeds along with the pulp. But with peppers, I'm happy to get rid of a little bit of seeds because they tend to have germination problems. So if the seeds are borderline um, floating and sinking, I often want to get rid of them with peppers. Um, so here I have a pretty clean um, Pretty clean batch of pepper seed. I could I could rinse it one more time, get a little cleaner, but we winnow our pepper seeds anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, and yeah, and that's a lot of pepper seeds. Do you do that with most wet processes? Win winnow. Um, yeah, some things you can't, like tomatoes, you can't really winnow, but um, we do it with pretty much all of our other wet process seeds. Just like it Im improves the quality just a little bit to do that. Um, so the next step is you get a screen. Um, and you pour it out on the screen. Now, I wish I'd thought to bring the Rime bags, but another way is to just put it on a Rime bag, tie it up, not a Rime bag, a piece of Rime row cover, tie it up and put it in front of a fan. Um, and then there's always a few seeds that stick in the bucket. <laughs> Got a little more water. And usually I'm doing this with a bucket and not a bin. It's a little easier. Um, so then a very important step is um, we need to find the label. Could someone get the label from that bucket in there? No, it's all the way in on the on the counter. I'll get it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank 
you. Um, it's just important to label everything. And what we'll do actually is um, add to the label. Actually, I'll just make a new label. Um, there's several dates that could be going on this label. Um, there's a harvest date, which is 924. There's the, um, the date that you start the ferment, which is 926. But this one, and then there's, I could have a different date that I process the ferment, but um, since I did them both on the same day, um, I put a line there. Yeah, and, and we found that with this mashing method with peppers, it works fine to not let them sit and ferment at all. When you're, when you're processing cores, like a big bucket full of cores, if you let them ferment for a day, and then they'll rub off the cores really easily. Um, but I also wanted to say that on a home scale, you can, um, you can just cut open a pepper, take the seeds, and directly just dry them. Um, and you're not gonna get quite as good germination that way, but maybe that's fine. Um, so that's a dry process method with peppers. Uh, and does anybody want a pepper? <laughs> Maybe later. What's that? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. It should be sweet. Um, anybody want more? If you want more, there's plenty more. Um, okay, so we've got this a cucumber ferment, um, and it's ready. Actually, there's a couple stages to this. What time is it? Four ten. Okay. Do we want to process all of these cucumbers? Yeah. Um, who's willing to help process? Okay. So let's let's process all these cucumbers. Um, I need um, So what people should do is start cutting them open like this. I'm slicing all the way through. Um, like halfway so that you can, that's a rock. So you can go like that. So cut them open and I got to get a bucket free here. So now other people could do this or whoever wants to do it. You just you just scoop the seeds out of the cucumber like that. Cucumbers are very closely related to melons. So um, cucumbers at this stage are it's just that you eat cucumbers when they're at an immature stage in terms of the seeds. So um, with cantaloupe melons, the eating stage is comparable to this yellow stage. Is 
those the silver slicers that you have? These are um, these are DMR two sixty four. It's a downy downy mildew resistant cucumber, um, and these are they're green. They're at the eating stage they're green, but they I think most or all cucumbers will dry to or will will mature to a yellow like this. There's some that will mature to a sort of a russet brown or orange. And you can like you can see that some of them are starting to rot a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like that one. Yeah, that's usually okay. You want to like maybe think about there's some diseases that can be connected to certain kinds of rot, so you want to be a little careful about rot. Um, yeah, well, you let them mature past and you would on like the harvest lab, and, and then you cure them, yeah. And a lot of times, I mean, you can also just sort of cure them by not harvesting them for a long time. <laughs> it just depends how you, um, sometimes you want to like get everything out of the field so you can use that field and then you'll cure them for longer or, um, Sometimes we'll harvest, <laughs> harvest stuff into a windrow and let it cure and then process it. Be done with a spoon, but spoon? what's that? Would you use a spoon? No, I'd use a metal spoon to to take the seeds out. Um, but I find that it's just kind of quicker to do it with your hand. Not worry about where the spoon might be. Move the label over. D264, DMR264, September 24th. Um, and actually what I want to do is add, a pro add another date to that in a minute. So it says 924, 926 to say that I processed it today. Um, so yeah, two days ago. Um, I'm going to go wash my hands and then I have a cucumber ferment that's been sitting for a couple days that, that will pour.
Um, so this is DMR two sixty four that was uh, harvested and processed two days ago. Um, and it's been sitting. You can see. I don't. I don't know if you can see it, but cucumber seeds have this sort of gel mm -hmm. around them. And one of the things the ferment does is break down the gel, and the gel inhibits germination. So that's an important step. Can you see some of them without the lid on, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. I just. So it's for travel. For travel, yeah. And so, yeah, stirring them twice a day. Um, tomatoes really need twice a day. Cucurbits can be once a day, usually. And then it got stirred as I was driving, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'll take this and add <coughs> water to it. It's nice to be like pouring from a high spot to a lower spot. Um, and uh, after you put the water in, you kind of let it settle for a little bit. Not super long. You want like the seeds to settle, but you don't want too much pulp to settle. So it's mostly seeds. There's some pulp still. Does anybody want to try that? The pour, the ferment pour. Okay. You want to try it? Okay. So I'll just like put this water back in, and then you. <laughs> <laughs> seconds. That's probably good. You keep going kind of fast. You be looking at what you're doing. More, more, stop. Yeah. Okay, anybody else want to do it? We could also, um, we actually want to get these cleaner because I actually, these are seeds that I care about a lot. Another bucket of water? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, we could pour this out and fill it. That's okay. What's that? Volunteers would be a whole album. Yeah. <laughs> Well, most of the good tea was out of it. Yeah, that, that did get that seed from you at Organic Grower School in the spring, and it grew great, and didn't have the down humility problem like wow. the other ones. Cool. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. When did you plant it? Where can we get Earlier this seed. Yeah. Um, we, um, that seed, we saw it through Commonwealth Seed Growers. Yeah. Um, it was developed at Cornell and just released re last year. Yeah. It's just like, 
It's a green slicer. It's kind of small. It's like that big. Um, you got to pick it when it's a little small. And uh, it's late, but it'll grow through the downy mildew. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Do you want to pour it or someone, someone else want to pour it? Come on, pour it. You can pour it. Okay, just so you can see it um, settling. So now's a good time. It's not totally settled, but it's kind of settled. Mm -hmm. A little faster, a little bit of back and forth. Uh, yeah, sure. A little more. Stop. Great. So, yeah, it's really... That's clean. And then... Well... I'll do one more. New water. The back and forth is a little slow. Yeah. A little slosh. A little more. Good. It's good. It's really good. And we winnow them. So, again, a little bit of stuff in there is okay. Um, but these are nice looking. And I think yeah, I guess I'll I would not put two different things on the same screen normally, but um, no, I'm not going to. I'll just like I'm going to put it in this uh, container and take it home. Really? Huh. <laughs> you go to school, you never know what you'll find. <laughs> Is it okay? Oh, yeah, we just rent it. Uh, okay. Where did I put them? And then I'm going to turn on the fan.
Maybe these will get somewhat dry by the time I leave. I mean, not, not really dry, but it's always a problem processing seeds when you go on a trip. <laughs> um, but this, this one, this ferment that I started, I'll just put the top back on and take it home. It's not a problem. Um, okay, what else? Tomatoes. I'm going to wash off the masher. It's good. Just want to make sure there's no seeds stuck in it. Um, does anybody want to mash it? These are from here, Arkansas Traveler. And you can do a whole bucket of tomatoes at once. It's just a partial bit, bucket. Um, And that's actually all I'm going to do with that. <laughs> so um, someone else here will come in a couple days and process this ferment. And you have to stir it twice a day or something. Right. Or you can let the mold form on it and just scrape off the mold before you stop start. But that would be a lot of You'd lose a bunch of seeds if you do that. Um, okay, so this is a really small tomato ferment from one tomato that Patrick gave me. Um, yeah, so this is more of a home scale thing here. So I don't know how long it was sitting. It actually came just as more of a rotten tomato in a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but, but since it was rotting, you know, it was like fully soupy. I'm going to count that as a ferment. I think it's probably enough to break down the, um, the gel on the seed. Um, and I'll try to process it right out of the bowl. And I forget what kind of tomato this is. I'm going to have to find out. Sometimes those tomato seeds can get stuck in the pulp a little bit. And you want to do like this a little bit. At the top of the bucket. Um, the other thing about tomatoes, we do, we often do what's called what we call a second chance. So that we'll pour, we'll pour into here, but with the idea that maybe we're gonna want to work with what I pour out again. Try the second chance bucket. Happens.
Well, I got a little bit extra seed, but not much. Mm -hmm. But I feel that it's worth it to do second chance. You know, it's like, you, otherwise you lose five or 10% of the seed with, with tomatoes. With, with peppers, I don't do a second chance at all. Because I want to get rid of seed that might be floating. Probably, I'm just probably going to give this to Patrick and see how he wants to dry it. But yeah, it's clean. The, they look, the gel has broken down. You don't see the gel. Um, and also another thing to look for is sprouting. Um, I don't see any sprouting. If you leave some, a ferment sit too long, it'll start sprouting. And that's not good. Um, I guess there's, there's some kind of show and tell stuff over here. Um, there's, let's see. These are just some jars of seed I brought to see, to show like how we label and store seed. Um, Lot C, bullnose, pepper, which is what, which is that. Um, I have a notebook where I have it written down what harvest dates. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Should I start over? Okay. Um, I have a notebook where it's written down what all the lot numbers correspond to in terms of harvest and processing dates. Um, and... See, we just made up a lot number system for Commonwealth seed growers. This is the variety, the year, the lot number, you know, just the, uh, the lot letter, and then the farm, Twin Oaks seeds. Um, so here we got two kinds of corn. Um, this is a sweet corn called Top Hat. It's from bred in Oregon. It's an open pollinated sugary enhanced, I believe, um, sweet corn. It's really hard to, to breed good open pollinated sweet corns. But this, um, this is bred by Jonathan Sparrow and I think he did a really good job with it. Um, it takes like different, different kinds of plants take different strategies and corn requires working with like several hundred plants simultaneously. You can't just like find one plant that you like and work with that. You have to find like a bunch of plants that, that you like and work with them all. So it's like kind of extra work. But what, what I think was um, one of the strategies he used was that there's a certain look of shrunkenness in the kernel that corresponds to um, the kind of sweetness gene that he was looking for. So he selected for that. But you can see um, sweet corn has drying issues. Um, you know, you pass the sweet corn stage, you let it sit on the field and get uh, to being mostly dry. Um, and if it rains during that time, it can, it can get mold on the seed. So this is one of the things about being in the east is like it makes sweet corn a little seed a little bit harder, but it's still totally possible. Like you can see this one looks pretty nice. Well, there's a bad spot, but it looks pretty nice. And what I'll do is just only take the good looking seeds. Um, and maybe I could do a stock, a stock seed selection for, um, for ears that, that dried down well. Um, now compare that to um, like flint corn or, or like more of a field corn that you use for dry, for dry eating. 
these these uh, dry down a whole lot better in the field. So uh, it's just a little easier to save seed from um, corn that has hard kernels in the dry stage. Uh, this is called glass gem. Um, it's just people like it because it's really pretty and it it does it makes good uh, corn meal also. Um, this these are these are. This is from our butternut and Waltham butternut and seminal pumpkin cross, and this is a fourth generation. Um, so I'm selecting for like butternut shape and flavor, downy mildew resistance, dry matter content because dry matter is a good indicator of flavor in squash, um, and productivity. And, um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about breeding inside, but um, this has actually been a project, a breeding project that has paid for itself because I have, um, even though it's not a completed variety, um, it's a lot more productive than the Waltham that I used to grow, and there's people interested in buying it even though the shapes aren't all uniform and everything. So I'm pretty happy with it. Um, that's about it. This is an overripe melon that we could cut open and see how it is. It's, this is um, this is a melon that was grown in Costa Rica um, that I, I, I saved the seeds from a grocery store melon and planted it to see what would happen. Um, and then I didn't take really great care of it, but I, I did get a few melons out of it. Um, that's it. So on, a, on a small scale, saving seed, uh, do you recommend just using jars like that and keep storing at room temperature, or is it better in refrigerated? Or? Yeah. Um, so what we do is we have a dehumidified um, seed drying room, and once we dry the seeds on the screens for about a week, we'll transfer them to um, into open jars, but still sitting in the dehumidified room. <coughs> So they'll keep drying like this a little bit, um, or for like a month or so, and then, um, and often we'll come back and winter them more and, and do more processing. But then you can put the lid on, and then it can go into to a non dehumidified space. And as long as it's nicely dried down in the jar and the jar is sealed, it works very well to put it in the fridge. Um, so for seed storage, you, it needs to be very dry. And cold is better, um, but cold and wet is not good. So if you take a seed packet and just put it in the fridge, that's not good. Or if you take seed that's not really dry enough and put it in a jar and close it, that's not good. What do you feel about freezing seed? Um, I'm not. Um, I do freeze seed, a lot of kinds of seed, um, to keep grain moths to kill grain moths. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like if you keep if you keep refreezing it, it will lower the quality quicker. Um, and this is something that I it's kind of a question that I have. Um, but I, if I once I've frozen it once, I would rather not freeze it again. If it's a um, I think it would be fine if it's like your stock seed and you're trying to keep it for longer. But in terms of I just have a question of whether it might decrease the vigor to keep freezing it. Do you have any? I'm bringing up to room temperature. I bet would. Yeah, I've kept seed in the freezer for. I've had lots of seed savers say not to do it. Yeah. But I've had seed like that yellow onion I was talking about, 13 years old, and I got like 70 percent germination. Yeah. yeah. And well, like. the germplasm banks, they freeze it, right? Yeah, but I think what they do is like. I think they're careful about like they'll have some frozen and some not frozen, and they don't want to be taking stuff in and out of the mm -hmm. freezer. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I yeah. Um, so, I would like to find out a little more about that. Yeah. Yeah. It dries better. Oh, right, right. And some people will use a desiccant that you can get like a silica desiccant to put in the jar to help dry it. I haven't really done that. We just use a dehumidified space that we have. Um, so that's good. What time is it?
So maybe um, we should just take a little break and then regroup and I'll go through a little bit of the selection and breeding stuff and then we can have dinner. So just uh, going to talk a bit about selection. When you're working with open pollinated um, plant populations, you're always doing selection. Um, and this is, even if you don't, even if, even if you're not trying to um, select for anything, you're going to end up selecting for whatever does best that year and whatever the climate was that year. Um, so it's good to um, recognize that and try to be intentional about where you're trying to go with your varieties. Um, oftentimes, I won't even, I won't even uh, save, I won't even really do a selection the first year I grow a variety. Um, I want to sort of get to know it a little bit more before I decide where I want to move it. Sometimes it's obvious, um, but sometimes it's um, a little more subtle. Um, so roguing versus selection. Roguing means basically you're taking out stuff that's really off. Um, so this might be an accidental cross that came into the population, or it might be just a mutated um, plant. Uh, it might be a diseased plant. Um, and you know you, you just want to get that stuff out of there. Um, it's usually not a high percentage of the population, um, hopefully. Um, Selection means, um, so with roguing, maybe you're taking out the worst 3% or the worst 10% um, that, that you really want out of the gene pool. Um, with selection, you're looking for the best 20% or the best maybe 10%, depending. Um, you know, you want to be careful with, with what plant type it is, not to get too narrow with the genetics. Um, but the selection, you're trying to get the best. Um, stock seed. Are people familiar with the concept of stock seed? So when I do a seed grow out, um, and I'm a seed production farmer, um, among other things, but when we produce seed, um, we'll rogue out the stuff that's r off, you know, that's, that's messed up or crossed or, uh, you know, really not right. And then the rest of it, we're going to keep and save the seed from. Um, but there's some portion of, of that rest of it that we're saving seed from that maybe I'm going to select uh, from as my planting stock that I'll use next time I plant that variety. Um, and it's good to know this. Um, this is one reason, this alone is one good reason to save seed. Like, when you get seed from a seed company, even a really good seed company, they're not giving you their stock seed. Um, they're giving you their, you know, the production seed, which has been rogued and, you know, looked at. And it's, you know, over, over the course of several seasons, the stock seed selection process is going to contribute to the quality of that, um, of the seed that you're getting. But in any given year, the best seed is being held over by the seed company to replant in the future. And when you save your own seed, you can be the person that replants the best seed. So, um, let's see. Um, so varieties that are very variable are better for doing selection out of because um, let's say maybe it was bred, it's, it was adapted to a different region and you bring it to your region, and there's some plants that do well and some that don't do well because it's a naturally variable population. So you're able to select the ones that do do well and work with those. If it's a really uniform variety, there's not going to be much variation, and there's not going to be much room to improve it through selection. Um, does that make sense to people? Do people have questions? Um, I might come back to that. Uh, yeah, I'll, something else. So, and this is going to apply to breeding too, but I talked earlier about um, different plants have different requirements for 
isolation distance and population size. So um, it's important to look up some information about whatever plant you're saving seed from in terms of those things. Um, if you're saving seed from corn, you need to be using like 100 plants. If you're saving seed from a tomato, um, it would be OK to just use one plant, although it might misrepresent the variety to if you're only using one plant. Um, but in terms of like, it's not going to hurt the genetics if you just use one or a few plants with a tomato. But with the corn, it'll cause inbreeding depression, which will make, um, if you only save corn seed from a few plants for a few years, um, you'll end up with a variety that has lost a lot of its vigor. Um, so breeding, the first thing about breeding is that selection is a kind of breeding. So um, you know, you can actually accomplish a lot and do a lot of breeding just by making selections out of populations uh, that you um, open pollinated varieties and populations. Um, but there's also making crosses. Um, and when you make a cross, you, you can cross several varieties. There's different ways to make a cross. But the simplest kind of cross is just to cross two varieties. And then the next generation is called the F1 generation. Um, the next one has F2 and down the line. Um, the first generation after the cross is going to be really um, uniform. It's, it's just it's an F1. It's a hybrid. It's what a lot of seeds are that you get from big seed companies are F1s. Um, and it's also important to know that you can take an F1 and save the seeds from it and plant it, and you're going to get a really variable. Um, you're going to get a really variable population the next year, but um, it might be really fun to work with, and you might find something really interesting that you can carry forward as a breeding project. So one strategy in breeding work is to take established hybrids, popular hybrids, and um, grow out the F2 generation and keep selecting. Um, and let's see. I think getting started at breeding is just like, there's a lot of like, it's really exciting and I want to encourage people to experiment and like maybe you find some accidental cross and it looks interesting to you and you know s save the seed and grow it out and see where it goes um, and you know I have this this thing like you need goals and you need a strategy um, but I think it's also important just to play around with stuff and and then your goals and your strategy will become more clear um, and um, so like. The the main breeding project. Let me see what next. The main breeding project I'm working on is a uh, downy mildew resistant butternut squash, which was Waltham butternut crosses seminal. Um, and I guess I was pretty clear on what I wanted early on. And th and there's a. Um, it was my impression that there was a need for a downy mildew resistant butternut. Um, but during the process, like. Maybe I'll come up with a downy mildew resistant pumpkin, and that'll be really popular too. Um, um, I'm also, yeah, let's see. But yeah, different kind of crops, you just need to read up on what it takes to breed them. Um, Carol Deppy has some really great writing about breeding. There's one called Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties. Yeah, um, and the resilient gardener, really good basic breeding stuff. Um, so variety trials are another really important part of this picture because let's say you set the goal to breed something. Let's say, let's say I set a goal to breed a downy mildew resistant butternut, but there was actually one already out there and I just didn't know about it because I didn't look for it. I didn't tests what was out there to try to find if there was something that already fit the, you know, that already fit what I wanted. Um, so it's important to, to look around and see what maybe, maybe what you're looking for is already out there. 
um, one reason for variety trials, but it's just like um, it's important to know what's out there. Maybe you find something, you know, you do a variety trial and you find something that has the shape that you want, but uh, but not the disease resistance. And then you, you know, it has the shape and the flavor, and it's early and it's productive, but it doesn't have this certain disease resistance. Then you find something else with the disease resistance, but not those other traits. You can make a cross and get all of those things into one variety. It's like really amazing um, the way it works. Um, How do you do that? I mean, you just plant them next to each other? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot more to this. Um, I work with cucurbit breeding, mostly squash and cucumbers. And uh, the first cross that, the cross that w led to the seminal Waltham project. I'm doing, that's what I did. I just planted them next to each other and worked from there. Uh, and like more recently, I've been doing hand pollinations, which um, is actually pretty easy with cucurbits. There's some good, um, I think there's a video on the uh, Seed Savers Exchange website about how to do hand pollination. Um, you know, you basically you, you go out in the evening, you tape up the male flowers and the female flowers that you want. You come back in the morning, take off the tape and pollinate. Um, and tape them back up and label them, and then um, you have the cross that you want. Um, it doesn't always take. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm not really getting too in, de in depth with breeding. You'll need to, to look more. Um, but what's important to know is that the F1 generation you only need a couple plants to move it forward. The F2 generation, you want to have a whole lot of plants so you can look for, because it's going to be really variable, and you want to find the one F2 plant that's, um, that's, that looks like what you're going for. Um, so more about trials. This is a really great resource. I went to a workshop, uh, an Organic Seed Alliance workshop, um, about trialing. And they were sort of, you know, talking about this, this trialing guide that they have, and then all of a sudden I was doing all these trials, and um, <coughs> mostly cucurbit trials for downy mildew. But um, let's see, a replicated trial versus a observation trial. Replicated trial is like a scientific; it's more of a scientific experiment where you have the same. Um, let's say you're trialing 10 different kinds of squash. If it's an observation trial, you just plant, you know, a few plants of each of those kinds and you compare them. If it's a replicated trial, you have, you're doing the same thing three times in different orders and spacings. Um, there's also different kinds of observation trials. You know, you, you could just sort of be in the course of your production, be planting a few different kinds of stuff and looking at it and getting an impression of it. Or you could do, be doing an op observation trial where you're like really recording a lot of data. Um, you can do an observation trial where you have uh, one of the varieties in the trial is replicated and that will help confirm that you're getting decent data. Um, is there any questions about that? Is, it, is this make sense? Earlier yeah. Yeah. You used the phrase like um, you're saying that people were interested in buying them already, even though they w they weren't a completed variety or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. By that, you just mean that like you're still kind of playing with them and yeah, it. yeah. Okay. I'm still like selecting and, but um, but I was surprised that like I was at Carolina Farm Stewards last year and I had all this squash and um, you know the. The ones that looked like butternuts, I was selling as butternuts already. But then I had all this other really weird, um, not weird, but I had a lot of really unusual squash. And then I had weird shapes from that cross. And there was someone from Eastern Carolina Organics there who was like, yeah, we we're totally interested in buying all that squash. So it's been a way to fund the breeding work with winter squash. Um, but I'm still, I'll still be like, working with it for a good while to get what I want. How do you decide what is a complete 
Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Like, how stable, how uniform do you want it? Um, like, maybe you want to have some variation in it. Maybe, you know, and then there's also the question of the standard practice is to get it to a certain point and then release it, but we've already, we're already releasing it. And, like, we sold F3 seeds last year and we'll sell F5 seeds this year. Um, so even though it's not completed, it's still useful to people and maybe it'll just continue being a work in progress. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Why? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So our trials, um, we got a SARE grant in 2014 and we did this huge replicated trial of, of melons, cucumbers, and winter squash. And if you go to the Commonwealth, commonwealthseeds.com, you can see the the report on it. It's really interesting. Basically, like, um, we're looking for downy mildew resistant material, and there's been um, there's been a lot of work on cucumbers, but not very much on other cucurbits, uh, including melons, gourds, watermelons, and winter squash. And so, like, we were really excited excited to stumble on this niche of work that needed to be done that wasn't being done. Um, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of needs out there that aren't being um, addressed because there's not that many people thinking about this on a regional level. You know, like maybe there's someone breeding um, breeding carrots for f for the mid upper Midwest and the Northeast, but they're not breeding it for the Southeast. You know, there's just a lot of things like that going on. So there's a lot of opportunities to do breeding and selection work. But then you also have to look at like what you have time and resources to be able to do. Like we found a way to fund the winter squash breeding because um, we can sell the squash, we can sell the seed, we got, we got a grant to do this, this initial trial. So you just have to um, look at what you have the resources for. And I want to this is um I'm just gonna show a few slides from our trials presentation. Um, this is like the presentation that I was giving last winter about our um about this Sarah Grant cucurbit trials thing. Um, sick. Um, F5. What's that? F5. F5 is a breeder. Full okay, thank you. I don't see it. Somehow I don't have F5, but. Oh, I get it. Um, mostly I just want to show you pictures, but I guess I didn't talk about it. Something interesting that happened was, um, it was a downy mildew trial, but I ended up getting a good bit of bacterial wilt. So trying to figure out what was, what issues were due to bacterial wilt and what was due to downy mildew was difficult. Um, that's downy mildew. This is a variety that used to be listed as resistant. Um, little leaf, that's a little, little leaf. Um, and that's from our 2013 trial. So it's just like, 2013 was a really bad year. It's downy mildew. Um, sorry, I wanna get to the pictures. It's a problem with having it, um, How can we improve the availability of downy mildew resistant varieties? So we have to be working in the region with trials and breeding to make this happen. Um, it's basically.
This is like what Downy Milley was doing to our crops early on. Um, and this, you know, we still got a good amount of seed out of this cucumber crop, but it was definitely impacted a lot also. Um, this is winter squash trial early in the season. You can see there's some plants that are little and some plants that are bigger. We, we planted all these tropical pumpkins and we had to give them an earlier planting date so they'd mature on time. We were trying to like basically plant them so that stuff would be maturing all at the end of September. Um, and that's later on. And cucumbers, cucumbers looking beautiful and then Melons looking terrible later on. Um, that's the DMR T64 cucumber surrounded by other stuff that's not as downy mildew resistant. Um, it was a lot of work. I had to go out every three days and harvest, you know, a hundred different plots of cucumbers and rate the foliage and it was, was kind of crazy. That's a susceptible variety. On the same day. That's Monsanto's downy mildew resistant variety. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm about done with this. I, uh, um, tasting. <laughs> there was bitter. Some varieties had bitterness. You know, it's important to look for. This is the melon trial. Anyway. Um, let's get something better looking. <laughs> That's a really downy mildew resistant melon, some at all. Which, um, yeah, we got that seed from Cornell and we really li liked it in the trial and now we're producing it. Um, any questions about trialing? Is there anything done with, uh, as far as being healthy plants versus stress plants? What, what may be affected by that? Right, like, like fertility maybe, or um, are you saying like if a plant didn't get you enough know, a lot of nutrients? Things, if it's, if it's stressed, it yeah. has more sugars or has counter, you know, counter uh, it has in its insects uh, attack can help, you know, with that. Uh -huh. I'm just uh, wondering if there's anything as far as seed. Um, I mean, mostly, like with the disease, that, like let's say with the cucurbit diseases, um, bacteria will and downy mildew just kill the plants and make it not a very productive thing. Uh, in terms of, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, it's, uh, you as far as the, the health of the seed, yeah. what the seed would be able to do uh, oh. you know, for the generation. Oh, so okay. It would be safe for my healthy plant versus when it's stressed. Oh, okay. Um, well, since we're dealing with, so we're talking about, this is a good question that, that relates to selection. So um, if we're continually saving from the healthy looking plants, we're going to end up with healthy, healthier genetics that'll be better suited to our region. Now, those selections might not be suitable for Oregon because we'd probably be selecting for stuff that's a little bit longer season. Um, there's also seed-borne diseases. So you, you might be saving seed from a plant that looks bad and there's actually, a, could be a disease um, that would affect the seed in future years. Um, and it's like 
another reason to save seed from plants that look healthy. But I mean, you it's you also could, you could intentionally stress a plant and produce something that was more sturdy, perhaps. Well, I think if you stress a population and then you look at what still does well, I think that's a good breeding technique. So something that people do is like, let's say they're trying to breed an anthracnose resistant watermelon. They'll plant in a field that they know has a lot of, you know, maybe it had an anthracnose infected <coughs> crop the year before. So they're intentionally planting it in a, in a um, problematic location so they can find what shines. This is called a, um, a screen in breeding. It's called, um, basically like you subject the plants to a, str to a stress that's similar to what you think they're going to be experiencing in, you know, production conditions and then whatever does well is what you, what you want to work with. With downy mildew, it just comes on its own. We don't really have to create it. But what we do do is, um, in our downy mildew selection breeding is we always plant late because downy mildew doesn't always show up. Um, like some years it'll show up in July, but some years it won't show up till the end of August. So we want to always be able to have our plants be impacted by downy mildew that we're working with. So we'll plant late to put that, that screen um, into play. Um, what else? There, is there any um, questions or areas of about like aspects of trialing that people would want to like talk about more or trialing I breeding? One yeah, and I don't usually ask because I'm not talking about. What were the variations in shape that you saw with your Waltham and your Seminole squash? Because I grew those this year too. I was so happy to get all your seeds and, and they did amazing and they did this interesting thing. So I was wondering what your experience was with those. Yeah, um, they ranged from like pumpkin shape to butternut shape. It was a third gen F3 cross, so um, pretty variable still. But it's, uh, and I am trying for butternut, so we're we're getting more uniformity this year, but I think it'll be a few more years before I really think that it's like, okay, this is just a butternut variety that I'm going to give its own name to. And this kind of goes with the earlier question, like in two or three years, I'm going to give it its own name and stop calling it Seminole Waltham Cross, uh, but I'm not exactly sure when. Because I had it happen, just so you know what happened. Yeah. I had it grow all over the place, very big, very beautiful, and then mm. it climbed up a forsythia bush, yeah. and all of the fruit on the forsythia were like little round, small ones, almost like it was going to make a lot more, but it knew the weight couldn't support, so then it changed and became these other shape all over the thing. So I have like a whole bunch of these little mini butternutty things. Wow, and are they, are they tan, have they ripened? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Like Do you think it was one plant or several plants that climbed up there? I think it was just there? one plant. Well, Maybe two. Okay. It could have been that that one plant was more, uh, you know, had that shape. Do you know that that and one only did it, when it, went up, only did it up there? It was like it knew. I have seen this thing with butternut, like with a butternut that's supposed to be a really small one, and then the er all the early ones will be small, but then it'll set, ones that get set late will be big. So I think that the conditions influence, like... It was the opposite. They were big first, and yeah. then they all were little. Cool. Um, in the same time, there were some that were normal size. They were great. Great seeds, great prolific production. Good. And disease resistant. Yeah. They went, but kept going, going, yeah. going. It's, um, I'm doing... This year, I'm like I kind of stepped up for the selection. I'm training each plant separately and um, self-pollinating each one. And I um, like they're all more resistant than the Waltham, but I'm still seeing a whole lot of variation in terms of how downy mildew resistant they are. Um,
yeah. Cool. Great. No. Um, but yeah, I really, I guess just to close, like I really recommend like checking out some of the resources that I put up. Were people able to write down the resources? Um, Organic Seed Alliance is really great. They have a conference every two years in Oregon. It's expensive to get to, you don't have to. But I recommend their website. And uh, if you're, if you're thinking about getting into breeding and seeds and or seed production or anything, it's a really good conference to go to. But also, um, I think there's going to be a bunch of several seed-focused workshops at Carolina Farm Stewards this year with OSA people. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>